Okay. All right. Right. Starting the webinar now. Hello. Um, hello and welcome to this, the third and the last Red List webinar for 2022. Um, please note that we are recording these webinars and we will be posting them on the IUCN Red List website in, probably in a few weeks time. So I am Caroline Pollock and I'm the Senior Programme Coordinator for the IUCN Red List Unit in Cambridge in the UK. And um, myself and the rest of the Red List Unit team we, we work to manage and to um, update the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species, and part of that task is to provide training and guidance for all of you assessors in the SSC network and beyond. So we, as our role is to actually help you to make the assessment process as easy as possible for you. So part of that um, role, we, we do sort of see the assessments that are coming in and we check them and we see the, the problems and the, the areas where you all struggle a bit. So the point of these webinars is to help you to um, get a bit more guidance and a, and a bit more of a resource that you can use to um, uh, refer to when you're doing your assessments. So in today's webinar, we are going to focus on um, a key part of the assessment process, which is the online database that we use to store all of the IUCN Red List assessments. This is the Species Information Service, or SIS for short. Um, now, people in the network who are working on assessments, you will have access to SIS, but sometimes it's not so clear as to what you're meant to do or what a particular data field is, is actually for. So the purpose of this webinar is to explain that kind of issue. Please note that we will not be talking about the Red List criteria. We will not be covering the parameters used in the criteria. Um, there are other webinars, there are other uh, resources available to help you with that. Today we will focus purely on the database and how to use it. So please, in your questions, try to focus on the uh, Species Information Service and not on the Red List criteria. So this is a very informal webinar. Um, we welcome your questions throughout. Um, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you put your cursor at the bottom of the screen, you will see a Q&A um, icon that will appear. If you click on that, you can ask questions in there. Um, I will be here throughout the whole webinar and I will be answering questions in the, in the Q&A function as we go along. And sometimes I might highlight a question to one of our speakers to, to answer live. Um, our speakers today are Craig Hilton Taylor, the manager of the IUCN Red List Unit based in Cambridge in the UK, and Janet Scott, program officer in the Red List Unit, also based in Cambridge. Now, Craig and Janet are extremely busy people. Um, so we're really, really privileged to have them here today, um, taking up valuable time to make sure this webinar goes smoothly. Um, so without any further delay, I'm going to hand on to Craig and Janet to start this webinar. Thank you. Thanks very much, Caroline, and hello to everybody online. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as Caroline says, we are going to focus on SIS, and we're not even going to show you all the different functionality in SIS, how you manage working sets, how you navigate the system. We get to very much focus on the level where most of you will be working at, at from the tax on homepage into the actual assessment itself and what you should do some common errors that we encounter. So I will now sh share my screen. Hopefully that should all be okay. So I've taken you straight into SIS onto a species page, what we call the taxon homepage, if you like. And uh, there's lots of different fields on this page that you can interact with. Um, for those of you, you, most of you should know that how SIS works, it's all based on the taxonomic hierarchy. So you can see this species is hanging off this whole hierarchy. So it's starting with the kingdom, going all the way down to the species level. Some of the assessments can go down, down even lower into subspecies, varieties, subpopulations. So you can go to levels below the species level. And each one of these taxa has a taxon homepage, which has various information, information associated with it. 
all of this taxonomy, the higher taxonomy and the actual species names and all these kinds of details you see on the screen here are managed and entered by the Redis unit. So if you need to assess a group of taxa that are not currently in SIS, or you spot things that are wrong in SIS in terms of the taxonomy, please let us know. We will get that fixed for you. So what I really want to focus on in this session before I hand over to Janet is what happens on, on this taxon homepage and some common errors that we find with uh, what people enter here. So the species has been entered here by ourselves with the authorities there, and we leave it up, often leave it to the uh, um, assessors to add the taxonomic source that they are using for that. Sometimes we will add it ourselves if we know what they're going to be following, because we work with very special groups, we know what the main sources that they follow. And usually this is a fish species, as you saw from that taxonomic hierarchy. Uh, we normally follow catalog of fishes, HMI's catalog of fishes as our standard taxonomic source. But in this case, that is not entered here. So either they deleted it or it wasn't there and they added these three other references here, which don't really seem to be anything to do with this taxonomic concept. And in fact, if you look across here at the taxonomic notes, you realize if I open up those, those references are in here. So they've put in the taxonomic notes and they've added the references on the outside over here. That is something that should not be done. If you want to add references into the taxonomic notes, just make the box slightly larger. In the top right hand corner is a cogwheel. Click on that, click on references, look for one of those references, that's one of them, attach it, and it then appears in the bibliography for the taxonomic notes. The reason for doing this is that these taxonomic notes can be pulled into a number of different assessments, global, global assessments, or they could be used for national assessments for people that are using the SI system for their national registers, or they could be used for regional assessments where we are running regional projects. And so it's important to have the references used in there because otherwise people will forget to put them into the actual assessment themselves. Uh, the other bit of behavior to explain here is that this field, the taxonomic notes field, can be edited by you at any time. <clears throat> um, when you submit your assessment, your Redis assessment for publication, when the Redis unit processes, processes it and we push it to publication in SIS, that publication workflow takes the contents of this field and any references attached to it, puts it into that draft assessment and then locks it. So that is how we have a snapshot of what was in the taxonomic notes at that particular point in time when that assessment was published. So that could be edited after the after the publication as you get new information to expand on the taxonomy and that will be pulled into the reassessment as and when that gets submitted and uh, processed for publication. So that's on the taxonomic sources. Uh, still on that, another example um, is uh, this one here. Once again, it's a species of fish. There's a taxonomic source that's been added here. Once again, it's not the catalog of fishes. It's, it's actually the reference that where this species was first described. So a reference from 1877. That is not a reference that, that is not the standard taxonomic source we would be using for this fish today. Yes, it was where the species was described, but it's not our taxonomic source. This should be the catalog of fishes. A uh, question that came up in the previous webinar was, where do we find a list of all the standard taxonomic sources? Uh, that should be on the Reddit's website, but the page for that has not been created yet and is coming. It is a work in progress, and we will put that up there. But it's very much a case that we work with the specialist groups. The specialist groups advise us as to what taxonomy they would like us to follow for the IUCN Red List. Looking at a different species of carinx and looking at a different section now that you can be adding in and editing. This is the cinnamon, so the top corner on the right hand side here. If you look at that list, you can see some strange things there. Two of the cinnamons are in italics and one is not. So something odd is happening there. Uh, what's good to see there's the basinum or the protein, the original combination for this name. So you can see that when Bennett described it, he described it under scomba and then subsequently it was transferred to genus carrots. So if you open up the synonyms and look at one of these, what the person has done here is added in the HTML coding to make those italics, thinking that that's what's needed. 
please do not do that. And in fact, we're busy working currently on a fix to stop people from doing that. So that when, when you look at these synonyms up here, they will appear in italics as the species name does up in, in the main box over here. So that's just an oversight in our part that we should have made that uh, from the get-go, but uh, we're now finally fixing that, that issue. So on synonyms, a common issue we find is that uh, people will tick multiple original combinations. So you can see Scomba amia, then there's 7058. That's obviously the original combination for Lichia, so that's fine. But there's another name up here which says it's a protonym. And that's actually the original combination for this species down here, Camp Campogramma vedigo. And they put in both of those as being basinums. And so that's, you shouldn't do that. And you should only be one basinum for this name that the species that you are assessing. The rest are just synonyms. And uh, in fact, that's another fix that we try to work on now is to make sure that there can only be one basin and ticks at any one point in time. So that's a fix that will come. If I open up the box and look at the other synonyms, you can see some strange things in here. So they've got some other combinations for Amia here. So you've got Hypocanthus Amia, Smith, Banners, and Sega, and Hypocanthus Amia, also Smith, Banners, Smith, Banners, and Sega. Those are what we call cresonins. So Smith, Venice, and Steger transferred the species from Scomba to this genus Hypocanthus. They spelled it wrong, but then they corrected themselves, Hypocanthus. But they are not the people that actually described that species. So these are what we call cresonins, how that name was used by those particular authors in that publication. And so that's not the right format to use. That should really be Linnaeus and brackets in both those cases. If for some reason you do want to record chrysanthemums, because some of the, our registered partners find that useful, particularly our bird life partner, they like to, to capture chrysanthemums. And so in that case, with this kingfisher here, you can see on the right hand side, they've put in some chrysanthemums, but this is not the right way to do it. In fact, there are two errors here. You can see it's a, it's a subspecies, the nominative subspecies that's been entered as being a, a chrysanthemum, two different sources. But it's not very clear from that format what they, how they've entered it, that those are in fact not synonyms, but are, it look, they look as though they're synonyms, but they are in fact chrysanthemums. So if I open that up and look at what they've done, you can see they've got the genus, species, and then a different line which says species name, they've got the subspecies name. They should really have selected at the top here subspecies and then entered it correctly on that line over there. Be aware if you're selecting from this list up here, subspecies for animals, subspecies for plants. It's a different entry because plants have a different, for animals we shouldn't really have SSP, but just for sake of convenience we do include the SSP, but for plants it is S-U-B-S-P, subs. Of course we have varieties uh, which is relevant for plants, but also can be relevant for animals because often some of the original combinations published a very, very long time ago might be varieties. An example of where they have done it correctly is this kingfisher, the Rampus penebris. And if you look at the synonyms here, you can see they've got the subspecies incorrectly, all the nominates, the correct authorities. And you can see there's a long dash and then the reference in full where that name is used. And ideally, those references should then be included in the, in the assessment as, as sources that have been used for the synonymy. The last thing I want to show you on this page is that you will occasionally come across instances where we've added a species and it's got underscore new. Why do we do that? Well, in this particular case, this Heliconia species, Heliconia gaboriana, has been split into two species. It's a new, narrower concept of gaboriana and in another species called litana, both from Ecuador. So, when we come to reassess the new narrow concept of Gaboriana, we can't stick it under the same old concept because then those two assessments are not comparable. You're talking about a different taxonomic entity, essentially. So that is why we have to have this new entry. But while this species is still on the red list with a published assessment, we can't just make this one Gaboriana because it means that that name would have to be, the other name would have to be dropped, marked as not recognized and dropped, and then it would disappear from the red list with no explanation. 
So while we're waiting for this new concept to be assessed, plus the split from it, Lutana, uh, that's why we use the new. But as soon as we are ready to publish this, once it gets submitted, we will uh, mark the old concept as not recognized and drop it so it disappears from the red list, and this will underscore new part will be dropped. And we often have notes on this bottom side here in, in red and bold to indicate what's going on, just to explain to users. If anybody looking at that, you can see, okay, that's what's happening there. So I shall stop sharing my screen now and hand over to Janice. Thanks, Craig. Uh, I'm now going to take you through some of the content within a red list assessment. So as I'm sure uh, most of you are aware, you can enter your um, assessment either through the box up here in the top right or through the assessments tab. The difference being that the um, top right box will only show you assessments which are part of the working set which you are currently in. And the one here in the uh, assessments tab will show you all assessments published or draft of that species. But either way, you can click into your assessment. Now, I'm not going to go through every single field. As Craig said, we're concentrating on a few key points in this webinar, um, issues that we encounter quite frequently and which it would really help us to help you if um, we can sort these out um, at an early stage of the assessment process. Um, first of all, the text fields within SIS. Uh, there's multiple of these text fields, distribution, population, etc. Um, here we have an example where the text as it is in SIS appears to be just fine. However, if we click on this button at the right to show the HTML source behind this text field, we will see that actually there's a load of HTML coding hidden within that, which isn't clear when you're simply looking at the text fields in its um, normal state. This betrays the fact that somebody has probably copy and pasted into the, the assessments. This is why we emphasize please not to copy and paste, especially from web pages or PDFs, directly into an assessment. If you need to copy and paste any text, please go via a text editor. Otherwise, you might be bringing in this kind of HTML coding and not even notice that it's there. So we do now have this source button. That's a relatively new development in SIS to help everybody, um, you and us, to see where this has, has gone wrong. But please always copy via um, Notepad or another plain text editor if you're copy and pasting. And if you know that you have, have some assessments that you have copy and pasted without doing that, or you're seeing some other funny things which you think that there might be something there to check, then you can click on that source tab and we can delete, delete that HTML coding. And we'll see that now it appears fine. There are other uh, text fields within SIS which don't have any um, formatting functionality associated with them, the justification boxes for each of the data fields. These justification boxes are really useful for you to support some key details of your assessment but it's important for you to be aware that these don't get published on the Red List website. So here in this example, we've got an explanation of the number of locations that it has been collected from two cave systems, which are affected separately by threats. That's a very valid explanation of the number of locations. That's really useful information. Um, but if this is the only place in the assessment that it mentions this, be aware that that's not going to be visible to anybody on the final red list assessment. So make sure you're not including any key information only in this kind of justification box. This would be appropriate information to also include in um, the distribution text or the threats text or the rationale somewhere to support the number of locations being two and therefore support your red list assessment. These parameter fields um, 
in which you can put numbers. We also um, would like to emphasize that you can, and in most cases should be in incorporating uncertainty within the data in those fields. So here we've got an area of occupancy entered as eight to 40. We often see assessments that have a simple single figure in each of these data fields, an area of occupancy of eight, for instance. Probably that's based on um, it being currently only known from two sites. But if you know that actually there's other suitable habitat nearby in which it's quite likely to occur that it hasn't just hasn't been surveyed for yet and you're able to estimate an upper end of that range, then it's far more appropriate to put in a range of values than to put a single figure when in all reality you're not sure that it's that particular figure. You can also go a step further with an SAS and put in a best estimate. Perhaps your best estimate is that it's at the low end. You think it's most likely to be eight, in which case you could put eight to 40, comma, eight. That means it's between eight and 40 and eight is your best estimate. Or one stage further than that, you can put in a best estimate for the range as well. So you might say that it's eight to 40, but your best estimate is eight to 16, and you'd enter that that way. So please, whenever you're entering figures um, which are somewhat uncertain, as most figures in assessments are, um, please use ranges wherever appropriate. Um, SIS won't let you enter anything that doesn't follow its accepted formatting. So if you end, try to enter something which isn't um, number, hyphen, number, comma, number, then it will bring up an error message that reminds you how to enter that information. Now, as I'm sure all of you are well aware, SIS is permissions based. It's quite cleverly structured to allow different people, different levels of access and to access different functionalities within the system. So this next part that I'm going to show you, it might be that not all of you can use, but it's important that you know it's there if this is relevant for your level of permissions. And that's the batch change function. I'm just going to go into a different species to show you this one. Say you're work, managing a working set um, of species which are all within the same biogeographic realm in the Arctic. Rather than go through every assessment separately, ticking the Arctic, if you've got permissions to do this, then you can use the batch change function. And that's access to the cogwheel here, and you can use batch change to overwrite it throughout the entire working set, overwrite it only if this field is blank, or you can use it to remove that data from every assessment in this working set. So obviously, please do be careful with these. You will potentially be overwriting other information if you select overwrite rather than overwrite only if blank. Um, so always think through what species you have in your working set and whether you really do want to apply this to all of them blanket throughout. But for simple things where it really is going to be the same throughout the set, um, then this is, can be a really useful time saver. But the other thing to be aware of with this batch change is that SIS won't let you do it until it has saved. So I've now go on to, gone on to my other species, which didn't have a bad ge geographic realm selected. If I tick in the Arctic in this one, and then try to do the same, the function doesn't seem to be there. That's simply because that information hasn't saved yet. So if I want to do a batch change, I have to click save first, and then I have the option appear to do the batch change. Now going to take you through um, references. Always, of course, please make sure that any reference that you cite within the assessment is properly referenced, that it's attached through SIS so that it appears in the bibliography of the assessment. 
you can access that either through the references menu or through the tools menu. Um, if you click view references, you'll get a list of anything which is attached to the assessment already, and that's helpfully sorted alphabetically. And it does indeed appear that this assessment, Bedeck et al. 2017, is attached to this assessment. But if I go in the other way and to manage references and actually have a look at how this reference was entered, then I'll see that there's a problem here. And correcting references um, is actually one of the things that really slows us down in the Red List unit. Um, when assessments come to us with references that are incorrectly formatted, we spend more time going through those assessments to correct those. Sometimes we end up simply having to send the whole batch back to you, the assessors and project managers to deal with because we don't have time to correct them. Sometimes they then might get delayed and only appear in the next red list update rather than the one that you were hoping for. So please do make sure that when you're entering references, you follow the guidelines. Uh, they're found in the documentation standards. Um, that you're attaching your references correctly and that they're formatted properly. So in this one, you'll see that actually, even though it appears that all of the information is there, well, the information is there, it's all been entered on the author line. That um, won't display correctly formatted on the Red List website. We obviously need the author fields to only contain the author string and then the year in the year field, the title in the title field, et cetera. The other thing that we ask you please to do whenever you're attaching references to assessments is to search for the reference first um, before entering it as a new reference. Otherwise, we, we end up with lots of duplicated references in SAS. You've probably seen this yourselves. You might search for a particular paper and find that there are two, three, four, many versions, all of the same references, probably because somebody has simply entered it anew without first checking to see whether it was in there. It's quicker for you as well if it's somebody's already entered it. So search by any combination of author, title and year to see whether the reference is already in the system before entering it yourself. I'll just use this reference as well to show you one final point. Um, there are different reference types uh, in this drop down menu here. The default is set to journal article, but if you're referencing a book, a book section, a an electronic source, then um, please select the correct one because there are different fields to complete for each type of reference. In electronic source, you'll see that we've got these access year and access date to show to, for you to record when that electronic source was accessed. If I were to write 2022 um, and 23rd of November in here, um, I might think that that was correct. I've put the year, I've put the dates within that year. Actually, that doesn't display correctly. SIS only takes the information from the access date field it doesn't take the information from the access year field. So if I were to generate that, I, you'd see it simply appears as access 23rd of November, 2022, that's... Sorry, I've shown you slightly wrong there. Um, but please make sure that you put the full year in there uh, to make sure that it displays correctly on the Red List website. So. One final point about references, if you're carrying out a reassessment uh, rather than a first time assessment, and that reassessment has been created from the previous published assessment, then the references in that assessment will have been carried across to the new assessment. Please, when you're doing the reassessment, as well as updating the information in the assessment itself, make sure that you're going through the reference list 
and removing anything which is no longer relevant to that to the new to the new assessment. We don't want um, things appearing in the bibliography when they're no longer cited in the text because they're no longer relevant to the current red list assessment. Okay, and I'll now pass back to Craig to take you through some of the classification schemes. Hi, um, just to interrupt, just before you move on, um, there haven't been many questions, you're all very quiet tonight, uh, or today, <laughs> um, but there is one that I would like to, I have actually answered in the Q&A part, but um, just like to highlight it here for everyone. So um, Charles Lennon has asked, um, can you use greater than or less than signs in the data fields? Um, I have answered already that uh, at the moment, no, you can't, um, but we are working on getting something in place. We're not sure how soon that will be. It might be greater than or less than, or it might be um, a, a list of ranges that you can select from that are all standardized. Um, but we don't have anything in place at the moment. So meanwhile, while you're waiting for that, you could put in your own range, which could reflect a really wide range of uncertainty. Um, because you might know it's only from two locations, two, two sites, but you actually might be two to 50 or two to 100, might be very uncertain. You can actually enter that information in and explain in the text why, why you've entered that. Thanks, Caroline, and thanks whoever asked that. That's a very good question, yeah. Right, thanks, Janet. Thanks, Caroline. I shall start again. So as Janet said, I'm going to talk now a bit about the classification schemes. And so I've gone back into the assessment where I left off from the Heliconia, the new concept of this Heliconia, which is endemic to Ecuador. One common issue we find when people are coding the countries of occurrence and even the subcountries of occurrence for where a species occurs is that they often use the quick add function. So they go to quick add and they find the unit and they click the unit and save it. And often they will just find the one that they think is the most appropriate. So this looks like it's correct. It's Ecuador and, and within Ecuador, it's the Ecuador mainland. So that to you might look okay, but in fact, the first part of this string is just a label to show that you are selecting a bit of Ecuador. You haven't actually selected Ecuador as a country itself. You just selected the subcountry unit. So if we took this and published this on the websites, it would mean that this species would not show up as occurring in Ecuador because Ecuador is missing from, from, the, from the data set. We do have lots of checks and balances in place to make sure that these things don't happen. So we do pick them up and, and fix them. And we are trying to sort out a fix that we might disable the quick add functionality here to stop people from doing this. But we have also had perverse cases where the countries have been in the system with the subcountry units, and then they've gone in and actually deleted the countries. So please be careful not to delete those entries. So a quick tip if you want to add in the missing country there, you just go open up the, the um, edit function, select add countries of currents. If you then just click save, it now adds Ecuador. But now in your attributes here, you need to look to make sure that the attributes all align up. You can see there's some things that are different. So it's now been ticked as resident, so that's okay. They had previously, and I'll save it, but you'll see here under Ecuador mainland subcountry unit, they've selected here formally bred. Please be very careful if you're using this formally bred field, only use it where it's really relevant. Um, in most cases, it's not relevant. It was really a field brought in primarily for, for bird uh, ranges. Uh, so just, be, just think about it very carefully. If, if you're not sure, rather leave it blank. Don't fill it in. So that's how it would look, and that's then all correct. The other thing to watch out for with countries of occurrence, if we look at this uh, paddlefish species. So this is a species that has been listed recently as being extinct, last seen in 2003. So if a species is extinct, that means that in the countries of occurrence, you need to make sure that the countries and all the subcountry units are all marked as extinct. 
often we find species listed as as um, extinct or even possibly extinct. And in the countries of occurrence, it says that presence is extant. So that's a common error to watch out for. And likewise, when you're mapping the range of the species, that should also be reflected in the range map. So that's the range map that's on the website. And it's all marked in as red, which means this, the whole range is being coded up as extinct. So the range map and the countries of occurrence all need to be consistent with each other. Turning to a different uh, classification scheme, the threats classification scheme. And as many of you might be aware, this is a scheme that's currently uh, up for discussion. Uh, we are engaging in a process to review and update the scheme, possibly add things to it, change the things in it. Uh, also change the way we uh, code threats. There's a whole lot of thinking going on at the moment around, around threats. So just some common issues around this is that when you're looking at a species that is used, or you think might be used, think very carefully how you record the biological resource use. So in this particular case, it has two resource uses, one intentional and one is unintentional. And in the assessment, it's very clear that it was heavily overfished. So it's a species that was targeted for, for consumption by people, but also while the Chinese are fishing for other species, this paddlefish also gets caught as bycatch. So in that case, both intentional and unintentional are correct codings for the species. If it is intentional use, when you open up the intentional use box, there's another box at the bottom here. Is international trade a significant driver? Please look out for that and fill that in wherever possible um, if you have that information, because that is really important for um, connecting species on the red list to our work in CITES, to look at what species that might be internationally traded that are not currently on CITES appendices. So if that's filled in, that might that might flag up the species as being a potential candidate for, for a CITES listing. So that's an important thing to try and add. If a species is used like that, you would expect in the use and trade section that there'd be similar information captured here. So it talks about the historic consumption of, of the species for food, but it says it's not utilized. So in fact, that was incorrect. It, it was utilized in the past. It's not utilized now because it's extinct, but that was incorrectly ticked there. So the species was used and it should have been coded down here. The end use should have been for food as human consumption. So this would be down here, food, and all that, that information filled in as they passed the so-called use. So just be careful to make sure that the threats information correspond with the use and trade information if the species is, is used. Going back to our heliconia, what happened? Don't. So in the use and trade section under that heliconia that we were looking at before, it describes that many other heliconia species are grown as ornamentals. These are popular garden plants, but they don't know whether this species is, is targeted for, for the trade or not. So in that case, you don't know whether it's used or not. So that box on the top right, no use trade information for the species should be ticked because you don't know, you think it might be used, but you're not sure. So tick that box. If you know it's not used and it said this one is not grown, then you will say tick that box saying not utilized. So that's the distinction between those two boxes. So just make sure that that tallies with the information that's entered into the, the text. Looking at the threat section, then you see something strange, and this is a very, very common mistake. So this species has biological resource use, intentional use coded as a threat. It's intentional use because of logging and wood harvesting. This is a herbaceous shrub, so you're not going to be logging it. And there was no talk about logging in the use and trade section. So what's happening here? So as you see from the top here, the species listed, listed as vulnerable to D2. This is because it occurs in an area that has been designated as a forest forestry concession zone. And they're not logging it at the moment, but they may do so in the future. So 
that is what they're trying to get at there, that they might be logging in that area in the future, but it's not of the species. They're logging the trees that are in that area. So in that case, it should have been coded as unintentional use. So you open up this use scheme, not intentional. It should be this one down here, unintentional. So the species was not the target of the harvesting. So just be aware that the distinction between intentional and unintentional. Intentional is that the species that you are assessing is the target of the use, or unintentional, it's, a, it's essentially bycatch, being affected by logging or hunting or trapping or gathering of, of, of other species in that area. So on the... Uh, The threats, just looking at a different set of threats. So we're moving now to a palm that occurs in Hawaii. <coughs> One of the big issues with species in Hawaii are the impacts of invasive species. And often the text accounts will list all sorts of invasive species. So here you have feral pigs and rats and various plants that might be affecting the species. It really helps us to actually code these named invasives in the threat classification scheme as they've done here. So they've said plants, they haven't specified what the plants are, this is text doesn't say it. But they have specified rats and they have specified feral pigs. And by having these named invasives here, enables us to link from the Redis website to the Global Invasive Species Database, to those named invasives that are on the GISD database. And the GISD database, database then provides information to uh, conservationists about how to go about managing those invasive species, and they also provide links back again to the red list to other species that might be impacted by the same species too. So you might want to learn something from that process. So it's a, it's a way of, inter of interconnecting those two databases, the red list and the global invasive species database. And it also enables us to, to do much more targeted analyses and, and targeted conservation work with the global invasive species specialist group. The last thing I want to show you in the classification schemes is a completely different kind of use, and that's with the whale shark. So in the use and trade section, there's a long bit of text all about how whale sharks are used as, as for food and various other things. And right at the very end is a whole long paragraph all about the tourism trade that's developed around whale sharks and people going out to go and see whale sharks and paying large amounts of money. So that essentially is not, um, you're not physically using the species, but they are generating lots of income and, and money that is then being invested like in, in conservation. So that is what we call non-consumptive use. So that's where you would tick this non-consumptive box and explain that there. And as Jenna said, that text does not get published. So that is why they had this very nice detailed section of text here which explains in detail how this non consumptive use of whale sharks is benefiting the species and how it all, how it all operates. So that's all I really want to cover on the, the classification schemes and just be aware that there are changes coming with the threat scheme and please get, to, get involved in the discussions that are going to be happening around that. It was an announcement posted recently through the SSE um, information service. Okay, I will now hand back to Janet. Oh, Craig, just before you do, um, so we've got Barb Taylor on, on the webinar. Um, mm -hmm. Barb has asked, um, what if international trade is important, but for another species, say the Vaquita Totoaba situation? Yeah, yeah, okay. Thanks, Barb, thanks for that question. So there the Totoaba is the species that has been targeted and the Vaquita is the bycatch as a result of that. So in that case, you would code, code it as unintentional uh, for the vaquita. If you're assessing the vaquita, it would appear as unintentional um, catch rather than targeted. Whereas in the, in the Totaba assessment, it would say intentional. And that extra field is international trade, a significant yeah, driver, will sense. only appear for the international one, so you won't have the option to specify it then for the Paquita. Correct. Thanks, Jan. Thanks for the question, Barb.
Okay, um, just now an eclectic mix of a few other common errors to look out for. First of all, um, as I'm sure most of you are well aware, there is a criteria calculator built into SIS. You can run it by clicking criteria calculator here, but it will also just automatically calculate it as, as you go through, whenever it saves, if there's sufficient information for it to calculate a category and criteria that will appear here. So please check that the category and criteria that appears here is the one that you're expecting to appear there. Uh, it also handily appears under the species name. Here we have a rationale which explains um, an endangered assessment. It's got a restricted area of occupancy um, and extent of occurrence, um, only known from two locations, continuing decline, and yet the criteria calculator is saying vulnerable D2. That indicates that there's something missing from your assessment to actually support that, um, to support the calculated, to support the category of endangered. If we go back through and check the fields, we'll see that um, AOO uh, has been filled in, EOO hasn't been filled in. So 25 to 100 should have been in here. We do have two locations. And yet that's still not enough for it to tell us endangered here. So have we entered the continuing decline? If we could click across to habitat decline, ah, no, we haven't, that's been set to unknown. So whenever you're getting a result from the criteria calculator, which isn't the result you're expecting, do go back through and see why that might be. And if there is continuing decline, if you, there's the information to support that, perhaps you've written it in the text, but please do fill in the fields appropriately as well. And you'll see now that the criteria calculator is working correctly. You can um, use the manual data option to override the criteria calculator. Um, the uh, calculator also doesn't work properly for the non-threatened categories, for least concerned, data deficient, near threatened, extinct and extinct in the wild. Often there's not enough information entered for the um, calculator to know what to do or to handle that appropriately. So in those cases, you will have to usually override it. But for the threatened categories, we really recommend trying to use the calculator because that uh, is a way of ensuring that all of the information to support that is correctly captured within the assessment. There are still cases where you might want to override it. Perhaps you've got a range of possible um, categories as an outcome due to ranges in different parameters and um, SIS is set up to be highly precautionary but if you think that actually the more realistic end is a different category then you can of course override that to select a different category in that instance. Now before we went through and um, corrected our data fields it was saying vulnerable D2. This is another um, thing which is quite often incorrectly entered in assessments. The box that triggers vulnerable D2 is this tick box here, this drop down box here, very restricted in, in area of occupancy and or number of locations. And if you select yes here, then it will automatically trigger vulnerable D2, assuming that is the highest category that is triggered by the assessment. But there's this text here, which is um, big and bold and surprisingly easy to ignore, telling you that you should only be set, setting that to yes if there is also this plausible future threat to drive the species to critically endangered or extinct in a very short time period. So this drop down box doesn't just refer to the status of being very restricted, it also implies that there is that future threat. So please only set that to yes if you are intending that to trigger vulnerable D2 due to it meeting that those conditions. One other thing which um, sometimes gets misunderstood by people is the purpose of this reviewed tick box. Um, 
the review tick box here should be completed whenever it has been kept but whenever the assessment has been through the internal review process, usually by the Red List Authority. When that review is completed, it should be ticked, the date selected, um, and the status set to pass if it has passed the review. Sometimes people try to um, submit assessments to us that are complete, that have been reviewed, um, but they haven't ticked this reviewed tick box because they have misunderstood its process, its purpose, and they think that that reviewed tick box re refers to the process that we go through in the red list unit. So the system won't let that assessment be submitted, and they might ask us, well, why not? The only thing that it's failing on is the reviewed, and that, that's you guys. Um, no, that review is for the internal review. Uh, we don't call our process the review. We call that the um, consistency check. Um, and apart from the occasional assessment that comes from completely outside the SSC network, all assessments should be reviewed and have that section completed before they get to us in the Red List unit. Another thing to look out for is the reasons for change section. This refers to changes since a previous published assessment of the species. If I go back to this taxon's homepage and look at its, its assessment list, we'll see that this is the first time this species is being assessed. That means that this reasons for change section should not be completed. It seems here that someone has misunderstood the purpose. They've um, written that the second site has been discovered since the assessment was first drafted. Um, they perhaps think that this box is to record changes in the assessment during the review process. It is not. It's to record changes since the previous published assessment. So if it's a first assessment, this section should just be completely blank. If there is a previous published assessment, then you should complete it appropriately, selecting whether it's a genuine or a non-genuine change, or whether there has been no change since the previous assessment. The last thing I'm going to point out to you in this section is SIS's internal validity checker or uh, integrity checker. You can run this on an individual assessment here or on an entire working set here. I'm just going to show you it on one species. This system runs a series of automatic checks to highlight any potential problems with your assessment. You can watch it working through um, each check. It's usually quite quick for a single assessment. If it's taking a long time, it often indicates that there's some sort of problem. This one was particularly quick because I had already run it on the machine and therefore actually my machine was looking for a cached version, but still it usually takes only a handful of seconds. You can download the results of the integrity check here, and um, that will open it up as a CSV. So you can open it up in Excel or another spreadsheet program to filter it and look for failures and warnings. I'm not going to do that here. Uh, I'm just going to quickly scroll down um, to show you that most of these are coming out as passed. But wherever there's a warning, you should not just ignore it, a failure um, will be highlighted in bright red and it won't let you submit the assessment if there's a failure, but warnings should not be ignored either. So wherever you've got a warning, please read the warning message and see whether there's anything that you need to act on. It might be that there's a piece of recommended information that you haven't entered and the system is asking you um, to check whether you intend to, uh, to submit the assessment without that recommended piece of information. Or it might be another point for you to check. Here we've got just one warning on data deficient reason. This is one which actually quite often gets misinterpreted because this specific warning, usually everything's fine. So this warning, often you don't need to act upon. 
the message says um, that the DD reason is missing and that if the DD assessment is based on taxonomy or unknown provenance, then you should complete that information in the assessment. But if it's based on insufficient information, then the DD reason is not required. Most DD assessments are not based on taxonomy of unknown provenance. There's simply a lack of data about the species. If that's the case for this species, which it is, then that's fine. We don't need to resolve this warning. The status of it having neither of these DD boxes ticked, provenance or taxonomic, is correct. That's the case for most DD assessments. It's only the case where you genuinely do not know at all where the species was from or is from that you should take provenance or where the taxonom taxonomic doubts are sufficient to prevent the assignment of another red list category, then you should tick taxonomic. Most of the cases where it's simply a lack of information or too uncertain information, then neither should be ticked. One last thing that I'm going to show you because somebody specifically asked about it in the last iteration of the webinar, um, is the subpopulation section. You see, as we scroll down to the bottom of subpopulation, there's an option to enter the number of subpopulations. Um, in many cases, people don't have this information, um, but sometimes you do. And you'll see that if you enter a number here, some further boxes appear below it including a justification for the number of subpopulations and a section where you can enter the details of each subpopulation. So here you can actually um, enter descriptions of each subpopulation, the number of mature individuals in each of those, and some other details about each of those subpopulations. So if you do have the information available, then um, that can be a really useful um, way of recording those details. Of course, um, please also describe the situation in the text. Okay, um, I'll hand back over to Craig now, unless there are any more questions in the Q&A for us to address. Um, nothing outstanding. Um... No, there's been a few questions about how people can download data, um, but I have mentioned there will be a, a, a talk about SIS Connect quite shortly. Thanks, Jared, and thanks, Caroline. Uh, right, let me share my screen. Right, uh, just in response to well, one thing that I forgot to mention previously about the classification schemes on the Redless website, if you go to the resources and publications section on the right hand side here and scroll down and open up the guidelines and brochures section, and here you'll see details of all the classification schemes. And each of these schemes has a, uh, a summary set of what the scheme looks like and a much more detailed uh, spreadsheet with examples and guidance on, on that. Those are all living documents that we keep adding to and changing over time. And once we finish the current consultation process on the threats, the threat scheme will be updated as a result of, of that process. So just keep an eye out on, on, on the, that page. And if you want more information on any of the schemes and how to use them, then please have a look, look there. You'll find more guidance about it. Uh, one of the other things that came up in the chat I saw was how to access uh, the Redless data. So when you do a, a search on the Redless website, there are various download options. And one of those download options is to do a uh, the results of, the, um, of whatever you've done a search on. Those results will give you CSV files for all the assessments in your search uh, that you undertook. But what appears in the, what CSV files appear all depends on what you have set under your username. So if you're using the website to download data, you need to create a user account, and then you log in your name, I'll show you how to do that, go to your name, you edit your profile, and just scroll down on the left, on, on the side that under your profile is download options. All of those tick boxes there, 
relate to a different CSV file with that data from the Redis assessments. So if you click all those boxes, you will get in get your CSV files with all that information in the, in that. So that is one way to to access the data. Another way <clears throat> for those who are more computer literate um, is you could use the Redis API. So if you just type API in the resources section. There's the link to it at the bottom there, the Redis API, and you can then apply for access to that. This search box here is very powerful in the resources section. Anything you're looking for, type, type your search terms in there. Everything in the resources section is, is tagged with keywords. And so we try to think of every possible word that people might use to search on things. And so hopefully you'll find it by using that, that search box in the resources section. Very, very useful. Um, what I really wanted to cover in this part now was uh, SIS Connect. So what is SIS Connect? So um, the whole purpose of this is really to act as an interface between SIS and external database systems. We were finding that many countries around the world have developed their own national databases, which is great for doing their national registering. And obviously they assess endemics as part of their national registers. And if they've assessed an endemic, that listing will then be a global listing. And we would love to get that onto the IUCN Red List. And the trouble is a lot of those national uh, projects are not being not connected to SSC. They're separate independent projects often run by governments. Um, they don't have staff to sit and enter all the data into SIS. They would rather just transfer it electronically from their database system to us to import into SIS. So that was the whole function of building SIS Connect. Uh, we could have allowed them to, to use SIS directly to import into SIS directly, but you could just imagine an external database connecting to SIS, bringing in data, it could very quickly muck up what's in SIS and, and cause major problems for us. So we decided it was better to have this external platform where we can get the data in, you can then run various checks on it, or automated checks, and then do a series of manual checks. And if we're happy that we're confident that the data is all fine, won't cause a problem, we can then import it into SIS. So that was the intentional, original intention of it. But as you'll see, as, as the system has grown, it has gained other uses. And one of the other uses for it is to export data out of SIS. So if you, um, you finish doing all the assessments for your group and you're busy wanting to draft a paper to with an analysis of the data before it gets published on the Redis website, you can then use SIS Connect to export the data from your working set that you've been working on and then analyze those assessments using your own R codes and other software that you might be using to, to do um, various analyses. Um, the other option is that not, an increasing number of countries are starting to use SIS Connect uh, to store some of their national assessments or do some, some of their national assessments in part, but not completely. They then want to export them out so that they can put them into their own database or place them onto a website of, for their own country. And so SIS Connect is the way of, of doing that kind of export. So it has two functions, bringing in data from external systems and exporting data out for analysis for your own database and for external websites. To access SIS, the different ways of accessing it, if you have an SIS active account, you automatically have access to SIS Connect, but initially you would only have access to the export function. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, if you're wanting to import, you have to let us know if you are wanting to import and we then change the permissions on your account to then uh, give you import permissions. So I'm just going to log into it so you can have a look at what it looks like. So the important thing is this information section which is opened up initially. This has lots of help things on it. Uh, sample data, sample working sets, a guide system, the guide still with different icons, and lots of icons that are used across it. Very detailed information about the data formats and guidance. That is really critical. Um, if you have an external system and you want to know 
if you're exporting the data from your system, what what structure do you need to export the data in? What what field names and what kind of fields are there? Are they text fields? Are they booleans? Are they drop down main, drop down lists? What are they? And so that section tells you all about that. Then there are further details about the lookup fields, classification schemes, and then lastly, there's a a partial update feature, and I'll come back to that in a moment. I'll just take on click on this one just to give you an idea of what the data formats and guidance looks like. So it's a lot of IT speak with field names, descriptors, data types, uh, the kind of field, the field with uh, the file where that field appears, and what it's what is needed and what is is optional, and so what's recommended and so on. So there's a long, long list of all the different data parameters that you could be uploading through SIS Connect. So you don't have to upload everything. Uh, you can upload just the ba bare basics and then go into SIS after you've done the upload and then add in the other information. So there may be information that you've got in an external system that you can quickly format into the right format, bring it in, and then uh, uploaded into, into SIS. One of the features that we're trying to develop, uh, a lot of us, a lot of people have asked us about, is can we quickly upload a set of references from EndNote or whatever bibliographic package you are using? And so SIS Connect would be the way we would do that. We are not there yet, but that's one of the things that we are looking at doing in the future. So we go to, across to working sets. So here I'm seeing everything that everybody's been importing. You can see Caroline's been doing a whole lot of imports and James. Um, and against each of these imports, you can see various icons. And if you put your cursor over them, you see that one, that little pull mark says the taxonomic errors. That one says there's record level validation warnings. That one says they also validation errors. So they're all different icons that tell you that may, they may or may not be problems in the uh, in whatever's been uploaded. Um, let's just look at an example. So when you you upload it as a zip file, but all the files within the zip file you upload have to follow the naming convention. You can't add or change those names. If you change the names it won't recognize the file. So they do have to match up. If it's got a line through it, it means that that file was not uploaded. That's fine. Um, so all the ones that don't have lines through, they've been uploaded. The master file is always the taxonomy file because that is the one that has the hierarchy, which if it's in SIS, must align. If it doesn't align, the taxonomy check here will tell us that there's a misalignment. Uh, it's a way of bringing in taxonomy, new taxonomy into SIS very quickly as well. You'll notice that there's an ID number here. This is a new, unique ID for this taxon. And that ID is then used to link to the information relevant to this taxon in all these other tables. So that number would appear in the countries table, in the credits table, in the habitats table. So you know that the information from that table links to this particular species. These IDs you generate yourself from your own database systems, or you can just be a random set of unique numbers, whatever you want to do. They don't have to be the SIS IDs, they, they generated by yourselves. So once you've generated your working set, you zipped all the files together, you come here, you want to add a new working set, you click on there, you attach the working set to that, give it a name, it comes into the system, and when it gets brought into SIS Connect, it then runs a whole series of checks. Depending on the number of, of tables you've brought in, the maximum number would be 16 files. It can take 30 to 40 minutes to run all the different checks. So it's looking at data integrity, uh, values that don't match up with what's expected. It's trying to apply the sort of general rules for what we expect given the data structure of, of SIS. It's just trying to check it. And then once it's done that, it then generates all these different icons. You then go into it and see, uh, is that an error or not an error? So for example, this one is a very simple one. All it had was the taxonomy. It was where I was bringing in taxonomy for the Hedipaniesi recently. 
you click on the top of the file, you can see what error messages they are. And it's saying there's a field missing. But because I'm not bringing in any other data sets here, any other files here, I don't need to have the taxon ID because it's not linking to anything else. So I can ignore that error. So there's lots of things like that which you just get to know over time that you can ignore them or you're not sure, ask the registry that we'll check for you and say, no, that's fine. You don't have to worry about that. Down at the bottom here, when you upload a, a working set, um, there's a way of communicating with the Redis unit through this comment box. You can send us comments. We can then reply back to you through this comment box. Instead of going through emails, it can all just be done through the system. But the system then does send you an email saying there is a message. So it's another way of communicating with us rather than directly through emails. Once you've got your working set in and you think all the errors are not, not a problem, you go to actions on the side here. Maybe it's fine one hasn't been. Yes, in this case, they've uploaded it and they've assigned it over here to the registry. They've asked us to, to check it. At that point, the system then sends us in the registry unit a email saying a working set has been uploaded. It's ready for import. We come along, we check all the information in here, make sure that none of these errors are serious. They won't cause any problems in SIS. And if we're happy with it, we will then say accept. Once we say accept, we then go into SIS, SIS itself and say, okay, there's a file coming in from SIS Connect, please accept it. It then does the import into SIS and runs further checks on the SIS end. And that's another way of detecting errors. And then at that point we might say, oh no, hang on, there's something we missed earlier. We will stop that import and come back to here to fix whatever it might be. Currently, fixing errors here means you have to export, download the zip file, unzip it, look at individual files, manually edit those files to correct whatever was wrong, and then re-upload. What we are looking at for some of the fields could be easily edited on the screen. So we're wanting to add an edit function into SIS Connect so you can do small edits directly in SIS Connect. So that's future functionality that we are hopefully will have in place next year at some time. Uh, once we have accepted it into SIS, then changes from um, to SIS import pass. So it's all gone through fine. You'll see a whole lot here that failed. So those ones have gone back to somebody. These are ones where the validation is passed, but they're still busy doing some testing. They haven't passed it over to the registry unit yet. So they haven't clicked to submit to the registry unit. So there's lots of these activities that are happening in SIS Connect all the time as people are working on bringing in different data sets, taxonomy, assessments. I also mentioned the partial update. So in SIS, you've got a working set of species. Uh, you've assessed them before. And you've now developed an algorithm to update the set of occurrence data for all that set of species. So you don't want to go through one by one and do that because your algorithm has produced a nice data set for you. If you can get that into the right format for SIS Connect, you can just import the set of occurrence data through SIS Connect and it will update that field, set of fields in your working set. So that's what we call a partial update. So you can be extent of occurrence, area of occupancy, number of vacations, a whole bunch of different fields that you want to have changed across a whole set of, of species in a working set. The partial update is a way of doing that. And it doesn't affect any of the other content in the in your draft assessments. Uh, before we had the problem where we tried to do it and it just overwrote everything and made all the other content blank. <laughs> so we've now fixed that. And so you can just update specific fields if you want to have updated through this new functionality. So that's essentially all I can really say about the uh, import process. Um, have to answer any questions about that. Let's just log out of there and I'll show you the export process. You know, I'll log in slightly differently for this one. So I've logged in using my SIS account directly. And you see now at the top here, it says SIS exports. 
And these are the ones that I have done recently. But if I wanted to create a new SIS export, I click this button. What it does then, it goes and looks at SIS and says, right, these are all your working sets. Which one do you want to export? So you just select whichever working set it is, say, I'll export Mediterranean marine plants. I just click the export function on the side there, and then it will go and run that, depending on how large that working set is, it can take a while to run. And once it's ready, it will appear in my list here, and then I can click the export to export that. And so what you saw before was a set of CSV files. The export will contain the same set of CSV files in the same structure that I showed before. And so if you have an external database, you can then easily import that data because you've got a system that's talking to SIS and you'll be able to then translate that back into your database structure if you have it set up that way. But if you want to do analysis, this is another way of getting amphibians. So our amphibian team recently busy, they just finished the reassessment of all the world amphibians. And I have, have written a paper, which has just been about to be submitted. And so they were using SIS Connect to export all the amphibian data out of SIS if they could do that analysis. There might be an analysis of the threats of countries and other use information and other, other attributes of the species. I think that's all I can really show at this stage. I'll just stop sharing there and see if there are any questions. Uh, no questions at all. I think SIS Connect has been a big surprise to most people and they don't actually realise this wonderful tool is there. Um, so thanks for showing us that, Craig. Well, one thing I would like to highlight um, about SIS Connect, so Craig was just showing you how to export data from SIS using SIS Connect. You, you can't export data from working sets you don't have permission to access. Um, so you can't just log into SIS and get any working set at all. It needs to be working sets that you have permission to, to, to work with. Um, so if you want to analyze any, any published data, the best way to do it is through the website, as Craig briefly showed you. The other advantage of SIS Connect is that uh, with uh, access, uh, with some of the large data sets, so, so for example, all, all reptiles, or all, all birds, you're talking about over 10,000 species, SIS um, access does not like that sort of number, it falls over. Yeah. So with SIS Connect, there's no limit. You can export large data sets through SIS Connect. It yeah. will take time because it, it is that large, but it, it does work. Yep, so wind up your internet, make sure it's as powerful as possible and use <laughs> SIS Connect. <laughs> Okay, there are no uh, more questions um, at the moment. So um, I guess we might be finishing a little bit early tonight. Um, so thanks, Craig and Janet, for that interesting webinar. We've, we've learned a lot about things that most people probably didn't think about. Um, the importance of adding references in the right place in taxonomic notes. Thinking about HTML codes when you're copying and pasting, you don't always see them, but they are there and they can cause an absolute headache. Data uncertainty, uh, we expect that to be used in assessments. Um, it's very rare that you have a very exact um, figure, so please do use the data uncertainty in, in, in the data fields. Think about the reference formatting. Remember the importance of keeping countries in place. It keeps the website functioning. So we don't want you to delete countries from the countries of occurrence. Even if your species is endemic to Hawaii, you need to record United States of America. Refer to the supporting information guidelines. I did put into the chat some links to follow. So this, I put in a link to the supporting information guidelines, the SIS self-teach tool, which is quite outdated now. It's, it was developed in 20, 2014 and a lot has happened in SIS, but it is a good starting point if you've got some new SSC members coming on board and you're just getting them used to using SIS. That's a really good tool, getting them used to it. And of course, SIS Connect, which is a, a revelation um, to quite a lot of you, I think. So thanks, Craig and Janet, again. Um, very interesting webinar, I thought. Um, thanks too to Tim Lyons, who 
has been very quiet in, in the background. Uh, Tim gave us access to the, the, the Zoom account today to make sure this webinar happened. Big thank you to New Mexico Biopack Society for helping us to make these webinars possible throughout the whole year. Um, very much appreciate them for, for allowing us to use a Zoom account. And thanks to all of you for joining us today and for um, all the questions you've been, you've been sending in. Um, I hope I've answered them correctly. I think I have. Um, and for, me, for our year's participants, happy Thanksgiving. And happy Thanksgiving, yes. <laughs> From Europe to America, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, so this is, as I said earlier, this is the last of the webinars for the Red List um, series for 2022. We will be back in 2023. We haven't yet decided on exactly what topics we will cover or when we will run, run the webinars. But if um, you have something that you really want to learn about um, for the red list that we've not covered yet, just send us an email. We'll ha we're happy to look at that suggestion and um, maybe consider it for a webinar next year. One topic we might cover is using the red list website. I think a lot of people don't realize how powerful the website is itself. So thanks again for joining us and depending on where you are in the world, have a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening or good night. Thank you.